Good afternoon, everybody. As Stella said, I'm Lucy Burgess, uh, and I lead the digital library team um, at the Bodleian in Oxford. And it's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon at Discovering Collections, Discovering Communities 2015, um, even at, at relatively short notice. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you about uh, digital.bodleian, which is one of our most exciting projects of, of recent years. And uh, this presentation is, um, uh, we talked earlier, I think Simon Tanner was talking about the glass, the wine, and the drinking. I don't know who won the vote. Um, but this presentation is really about uh, the glass and the wine, because we haven't really started the drinking yet, because this was only launched in July. So the Bacchanalian process has yet, uh, yet to begin, but I'm very much looking forward to it. So I'm going to um, talk to you about digital.bodleian. We're going to have a little demo of the site, um, and I'm going to talk to you a bit about digital research and public engagement and how they have um, been big drivers of this project, uh, because they're key strands of our digital strategy at the Bodleian. And I'm going to talk about some of the practicalities of bringing collections to new audiences with a focus on the practical details and the very pragmatic things that we did and not the theory. Um, and I will also confess the things that we would do differently if we had our time again. Um, so I shall limit the triumphal rhetoric, which uh, somebody else mentioned uh, this afternoon, hopefully. So um, before I go on, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Bodleian Library, to, um, or libraries, I should say, uh, to set... Uh, the project in context. So the Bodleian, as many of you know, is not just a single library, but actually a system of 29 libraries that forms one of the great institutions of the University of Oxford. And it was founded by a remarkable man called Sir Thomas Bodley. He was a diplomat, a gentleman usher to Queen Elizabeth I. He was a scholar of Greek and natural philosophy and European languages, because in those days you just kind of had to study everything. And he founded the Bodleian in 1600 with a collection that began with donations from great historians and antiquaries such as the Earl of Essex, Sir Robert Cotton and Henry Saville. And in 1610, he signed a very famous agreement with the Stationers' Company in London to supply a library, his library with a free copy unbound of all new books and copies never printed before. And for those of you who are librarians and know about the system of legal deposit, that was um, the agreement that founded uh, this system of legal deposit in the UK and remained pretty much largely unchanged for about 400 years until uh, in 2013, we got the quaintly named non-print legal deposit libraries regulation which meant that we could collect websites and e-journals and all of those other digital things. Um, so although steeped in history, uh, the Bodleian is, you know, it's a very modern university library serving students and researchers in all disciplines, uh, supporting excellence in research and teaching and public engagement. So this is what you get if you put uh, all of the words from the front page of the DCDC 2015 uh, website into a Wordle. And I thought this was quite nice because it, um, I think it has a lot of resonance with the things that we are trying to achieve in Oxford through our digital collections at the Bodleian. Now, I'm going to focus today on our digitised collections, but of course we have you know, a wealth of material, much of it born digital as well. So I talked about briefly about the web archive, that's 80 terabytes now, um, a shared service with the British Library and the other uh, legal deposit libraries. We've got half a million e-books. We have more than 400,000 digitised books through our partnership with Google. Uh, 70,000 e-journal titles. We've got data sets now through um, our uh, research data service that we launched this year. Uh, text corpora. Um, you know, it's a very, very long list. And two and a half million uh, digitised images. And um, I think it's that petabyte scale in our digital collections which makes us a really natural playground for digital humanities scholars to engage with. Now, um, Simon Tanner this morning also talked about uh, scale and said basically, you know, in the attention economy, um, you know, you can't just rely on numbers for your digitisation projects. And I think that's absolutely right. But I would just like to point out that the Bodleian Archive is not made up of Facebook pictures of babies. <laughs> so there are lots of extraordinary, wonderful images in here of, um, of special collections. So I, I hope, you know, the value of this resource will really shine through as well as the numbers. But with, um, with digital.bodleian, uh, so far we have taken 120,000 images from 25 years of digitisation projects and brought them under a single roof. And that's not just a front end, but um, actually quite a complex infrastructure which sits underneath. And, and it is the infrastructure that has been really, really important in making all of this work. So um, 
Uh, as I said, you know, we've got an, an amazing collection and we're privileged to hold collections at the Bodleian that are significant and extraordinary from a scholarly point of view. And much of the content has got a really historic and aesthetic richness uh, that holds value for non-academic users too. Um, so we get about 60, 70,000 readers at the Bodleian every year, but 40% of those are from beyond the university. And with this resource, we were really trying to appeal to that new audience as well as our traditional scholarly audience. So you'll be pleased to know this is not the, the, the new homepage. This is an example of one of our old sites. Um, so our digitised collections have been online for, for over, as I said, 20 years. Well, you know, we've got... Um, archives, manuscripts, books, maps, uh, music scores and a wealth of other content and they traditionally have been in quite siloed, discrete, project driven libraries like this one and that meant that their functionality for public discourse has been quite limited and as you can see they were, they were you know, restricted by both design and technology, you can see that definitely design trends have moved on. So here are some examples of our previous sites. This is Luna. Um, it is not exactly pretty, but it was very functional. You know, the academics that, that use this site um, really liked it. Uh, here is our um, electronic catalogue of medieval and Renaissance manuscripts. So, but each of those had a different search interface. You had to learn what you were doing every time. They all had um, very different infrastructures which uh, supported them underneath. They had different descriptive formats. So actually bringing that material together and um, making it available for, let's say, cross-search across collections was, was virtually impossible. It was certainly very, very difficult. So with digital.bodleian, we had... Um, a clear vision, which was to draw in new audiences, um, to provide a more modern service to our academics, um, and to unite the collections, really, in a more, much more contemporary and engaging way, using innovative technology. And what you see on the screen in front of you is the new homepage. And in a moment, we are going to do a demo. But before we move on to that, there are just three principles that I wanted to briefly talk about that really drove... Um, the foundations to the site and the first was having open collections so we wanted to use an open license that allows people to use and reuse images for education and research so for non-commercial purposes without paying a fee that was a you know a key thing so our license does allow that you can download all of the images on digital.bodleian um, at medium resolution and it won't cost you a penny so that's great and you can use them uh, for teaching and research um, and then the second point was around open standards. And I wasn't here yesterday for Simon Chaplin's talk, but I think he talked about IIIF, which was a, you know, a, a big theme that ran through, um, through this project. So metadata and APIs that allow the collections to be shared with as few technical barriers as possible. So we're using Dublin Core as the metadata standard that we've transformed all of our metadata to. And we're using this thing called IIIF, the International Image Interoperability Framework, uh, which is a, a set of APIs for uh, metadata and presentation of images, which means that you can see things at very, very high resolution. Um, and you can share things easily and you can do comparative scholarship without taking up loads of bandwidth. So it's a, it's a fantastic framework. It's now inaugurated as um, a founding. Um, we, have a, we have a new membership organisation and if people are interested in joining, uh, that would be absolutely wonderful. We are open for new members, but you can use the suite of APIs without being a member. They're all fully open and published under a CC BY licence. Yes, and open software. The, uh, the interface that, uh, that powers uh, digital.bodleian was developed in, in collaboration with um, a software vendor called Armadillo Systems, who are quite a small company. And um, we started this project quite a long time ago. And originally, we were their very first customer for this interface. And we did a lot of co-development with them. Um, and they, they have now said that they will make this interface open source. They haven't done that yet because they're building a new version of it. Uh, but we very much hope that that will happen. And all of the code that, uh, that we have written um, for the infrastructure underneath is also open. So you can see that on GitHub. So now we're going to do a quick demo. We can change the screen, fantastic. So this is the front page of, uh, of digital.bodleian and you can see um, the various collections that we have available by swiping up and down. 
So we've got things like our Western manuscripts. Uh, so we've got things like the uh, Romain de la Rose, a French medieval poem, which I'll show you, and the Romance of Alexander. We have Greek and Hebrew manuscripts. So we've got... Um, Gems such as the oldest surviving commoner version of Euclid's text from the 4th century AD. We've got um, children's games from the John Johnson collection of ephemera. We have the medieval goth map, which is down here. See that? Uh, we have um, some absolutely beautiful botanical watercolours by the Australian illustrator, um, Austrian, I should say, illustrator Ferdinand Bauer. We have accounts of early 19th century expeditions to Egypt. We have a wonderful collection from the Ashmolean Museum, uh, some excavations of um, Knossos and plans by Sir Arthur Evans. We've got some beautiful insects uh, from the entomologist's useful compendium. And if we've got time at the end, I will show you um, some more of the images. But the, for the front page, you basically, you just swipe up and down and you can go into a collection if you, if you want to, or you can search from the front page. So what I'm going to do is um, search from the front page and I'm going to give you a quick demo of the faceted browse and search across collections. So first of all, I'm going to type France. So I'm looking for French materials. Okay, and then I'm going to go down. I'm going to click maps on the left. And then I'm going to refine by language, Latin. And this shows um, a map of France and Belgium from 1477. So you can see that on the left hand side, you have the various facets that you might expect. So we have, um, we've translated things into, uh, into both subject um, collections and languages so that you can easily find things as well as using um, the search tool at the top. So now I'm going to show you um, one of our Hebrew manuscripts, which is the Moray Nevakim. There we go. Okay. So um, this was digitised uh, under our Polonsky Foundation digitisation project. And um, I just want to show you the zoom, because I mean, this has got a really nice, um, really nice ownership mark on the... Um, on the front of the binding, which of course is a more modern binding. So you can zoom in like this, or you can go full screen, and you can go right into the detail, which is really incredible. And it's you know it's doing this and it's doing this on my Wi-Fi connection. So you know the performance is fantastic. We've done quite a lot of caching to make this work, but um, it, it is working really really well. So I'm really pleased about that. Um, Okay, so and of course that, you know, looking at that very fine detail is exactly what humanity scholars want to be able to do, especially if they can't always see um, the objects right in front of them. So, for example, if you're looking at annotations or um, ownership marks or illuminations or marginalia, then this is really, really important. And it is the IIIF set of APIs which is making this work, as well as uh, the infrastructure that we have built underneath to, um, to deliver it. Okay, so I'm just going to go back. Right, and now we're going to look at um, the Romain de la Rose. Here we go. So if you click into the image, you can you can either navigate here with this bar at the top, or you can literally just um, just click through the pages. Oh, I don't, I don't want to do that. So there's a, an example of the zoom again, and I just want to get to the right page so I can show you this image, which I think is really interesting and quite beautiful. So um, obviously you're looking at this from uh, from a real distance. And this is one of my favourite images because there's a lovely, well, there are two lovely animals actually in this in this image. And um, I thought this was a monkey, but I'm reliably informed that it's a cat. <laughs> so, and you have to have a, a presentation about digital stuff with a cat in it, don't you? So there we go. Um, <laughs> and you can also um, download these images. 
So if you want to, if you click this button here, that will give you um, a download option and you can download either the image file or the metadata or a citation. Um, so this will give you, um, it won't just give you a single image, it will give you all, in this case, all 400 images for this particular manuscript. And then finally. So do have a play with this and, um, and tell us what you think about the navigation. We've had lots of feedback on it and um, we, there are lots of things we, we want to do to improve it, but I'm really interested in your feedback. So if there are things you want to say about it, you can tweet me at BDLSS or at Bodleian Libs or at Lucy C. Burgess. So there's one more item I want to show you, which is um, from the John Johnson collection. So this is called Round of Fun, Six Happy Scenes of School Life. Oh. Okay. Um, so you can see there are two logos here on the right. So the, the triple IF logo here, and this will give you what's called the manifest of the item, which is a JSON linked data document. You don't need to worry about this too much, but if you're, for any techies in the room, you can click on this and it will give you a JSON linked data document that explains all of the uh, information um, around both the structure and the delivery and presentation of the content. And then if you click on this button here, UV, we've implemented um, the British Library uh, Welcome Library uh, and Digerati Viewer, which is called the Universal Viewer. This is a project that I was privileged to work on uh, before I left the British Library. And um, so because the Universal Viewer, again, uses the IIIF set of APIs and because our infrastructure is compliant with the IIIF set of APIs, we could implement any viewer on the site that was uh, compatible with that set of APIs. So we could use the British Library's viewer, we could use Mirador, we could use um, the Austrian National Library's viewer, and we could implement all of those viewers pretty quickly. Uh, so what's, what's really nice about this, I think, is just the, the flexibility of the whole thing. I actually, I love this viewer. I think it's fantastic. You know, you've got the metadata on the right-hand side. You have the image in the middle. It's got all of the deep zoom functionality that you would expect. And it's got the thumbnails on the left. So the navigation is really, really nice. And, and the British Library did, you know, a huge amount of, of user research um, uh, to be able to implement this. And it's fantastic to see the collaboration between the BL and um, the Wellcome Library and Digerati on this. So I just wanted to say just a few more words about um, the infrastructure. Um, this was really designed to scale. Uh, so we've used a microservices type architecture, which means that the metadata and the images and the search service and the image delivery services can easily be reused by other projects. So we could bring in museum collections, we could bring in uh, the collections of the Ashmolean, and as long as we're using the IIIF standard and we're putting the images in our underlying image repository, they can all use this infrastructure. So we've invested in a single repository which sits underneath, um, and that repository integrates with our digitization workflows. And so we use something called Gooby at the, the Bodleian Libraries, and that gives them this seamless connection between the creation of the content, uh, the long-term preservation of the content in the repository, and the delivery of the content to a public or scholarly audience. So the whole thing is integrated from end to end, and that's the beauty of it. So, so when I say, you know, I really hope that we can get a million images in here by the year end, I'm, I'm you know, the cal not, the, not the calendar year, I hasten to add, the academic year, <laughs> I'm pretty confident that we'll be able to do that. So, of course, no launch of a digital product would be complete without a social media campaign around it. And I want to thank both Emma Stanford, who's our digitisation assistant, and Liz McCarthy, who's our web and social media manager in our comms team, who tweeted and blogged prolifically around the launch of digital.bodleian. And between us, we got about 100,000 Twitter impressions. And from those 2,800 engagements, so that's people who directly interact with the service following a tweet, um, and about 700 retweets. So that's that's not bad for uh, you know for three people having a go. Um, and we did some fun things after the launch. So we got people to. Um, uh, to tweet, and we encourage them to do that by using the hashtags Bodleian Animals, uh, Bodleian Travel, and Bodleian Death. That's my favourite. 
<laughs> so, and we got some really good engagement from those publicity campaigns. Um, so regularly sort of 15 to 20 retweets when we ask people to, to find their weirdest and favorite collection items. And um, Emma turned our tweets into a Storify collection, which was really nice. And, and then there are a couple of blogs that I just wanted to, to mention briefly. So one in the center um, was from somebody called Sarah, Sarah Werner, who has a really interesting blog that speci specifically mentions digital.bodleian. And she, both, she gives it both praise and criticism. Um, so uh, if you have a read, it's called How to Destroy Special Collections with Social Media. So that's put kind of satirically, but it's a guide for researchers and librarians. It's very interesting. And there's another one by Hannah Froelich, uh, which talks eloquently around the issues of citing digitized texts and resources and, and made me think that we should probably do something similar for uh, digital.bodleian. So here are our Google Analytics. Um, on our landing page, for the first three months of, uh, of use, we've had 37,000 visits from 30,000 individual users. And on the, uh, the search and browse page, we've had uh, 21,000 visits from 17,000 individual users. Now, those stats are, I'm, I'm quite happy with those stats, but they're not as high as we would like them to be. So, as I say, we haven't quite started the drinking yet. There is more drinking to do, which is good. But we're getting about um, something between 50 to 100 visitors a day to our browse interface and 100 to 200 per day to the landing page. And we've had visitors from 147 countries, which is fantastic. Uh, and 25% of our traffic is coming from mobiles. Now, I was actually surprised by that number. I don't know how that compares to uh, other people in the room, but... I was expecting it to be much, much higher. And we know we've got some work to do on our interface to make it more responsive for mobile delivery. It does, it works fine on an iPad, but it's not as beautiful as I would like it to be. So for example, you have to click icons in certain places rather than using the, you know, the, the pinch and zoom. So we know we've got some work to do there. And uh, we got a spike in usage on the weekend of uh, August 8th to the 9th, when the site was visited nearly 10,000 times due to this article by The Guardian's Jonathan Jones. And uh, it highlighted uh, our universal accessibility and included a gallery of images, which I'll, if we've got time, which I don't think we will, I'll show you quickly at the end. But what I really liked about this article was the comments that it um, provoked. And if you can get over the sort of febrile atmosphere of all the things that people say about Jeremy Corbyn, there are some real <laughs> gems. <laughs> <laughs> so here are some of those gems. So uh, the middle uh, section of comments was quite an interesting debate between two people about whether uh, one item should have been catalogued as being from Myanmar or Burma. So I thought that was quite interesting. And there was one at the bottom uh, from this user called Canada Tyke, which reads, I have an ongoing grudge against museum curators who believe that they know what I want to see. Believe me, they don't. In the good old days, museums were relatively dark and cluttered with everything the museum owned. And I thought that was magic. I loved walking around, totally immersed in that wonderful ancient world. And then he goes on to say some uncompl uncomplimentary things about museum curators, which given the company I'm keeping today, I won't repeat, but they're on the screen. <laughs> and then he says, finally, show me and let me decide. And, um, and I really like that because actually that was one of the big drivers for us. You know, we just wanted to get our collections out there and, and make them viewable. Uh, and then some people you just can't please. So this person at the top, he says, no, that Hebrew manuscript is still boring. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I'm running out of time, I think. So I just wanted to uh, talk some quickly. This is my confession. So the five things that we would do differently next time. So firstly, if anybody is building an image delivery service of any shape or form, can I urge you please to use IIIF. It's really easy to implement. It's absolutely fantastic. It works. It's open source. Um, and you, know, you should absolutely use it. And, and we are using it now, but it wasn't baked into the project from the beginning. And I think that's probably because um, we started you know, four years ago working on this. And at the time, IIIF was not as ubiquitous as it is now. It, is now. it wasn't so much of an option for us. So, but it will be mandatory for any future phases of development. The second thing is to have, um, we would have 
built in uh, what I'm calling a metadata architecture a little bit more. So at the moment, um, the metadata that you see on digital.bodlin is essentially static. So if your curator makes any changes to uh, metadata in the underlying catalogs, it won't feed through. And that's, you know, that's partly because um, it was complicated at that time to do that level of integration. And also, we have so much material at the Bodleian that you know, we catalog things once, and then they're done, pretty much. But of course, if you, want to, you know, if you want to build in crowdsourcing, if you really want to use the things like the public tagging functionality that we have, then there should be a way of building that back into the metadata. So um, one of the things on our roadmap is to integrate this more fully into the catalogs that, that feed digital.bodleian. Um, so to bring that metadata in on the fly um, so that it's not just a one-time thing. And then also we use Dublin Core, but it's actually quite a restrictive format we have found. And if we want you know, our museums and galleries and, and gardens to be able to show their digit digitised stuff at, uh, at Oxford, which is very much what we want to do, we are thinking about replacing Dublin Core with something like the Europeana data model or perhaps the... Um, DPLA metadata application profile, which is itself based on the Europeana profile. Um, and that would at least make, I think, you know, the thing perhaps more standard across cultural heritage rather than just libraries. And then we would also do mobile first. So again, this is you know, partly because of the history, because we, we've spent four years working on this project. Mobile wasn't properly baked in right from the beginning, and we're working with uh, Armadillo for the next version of the interface to be much more responsive than it, than it currently is. And then finally, I would have used a Creative Commons license. So um, the, uh, the license that we have available on the site is a non-commercial license. Uh, and technically, it doesn't allow for people to repost uh, the content on blogs, for example because that is not strictly a non-commercial use. And, and, you know, it sort of feels... Uh, I didn't show you the, the tweet button. You can tweet all, links to all of these, um, these images. And, of course, you know, if we're using a non-commercial licence and we're encouraging people to tweet links to the images or even the images themselves and build them into Wikipedia, but we're not actually giving them the licence to do that, that is, you know, that doesn't make sense. So we're going to revisit our license. It's one of the things that, that users have complained about the most. I would like to use a CC BY license. We've got some work to do with our, uh, our legal counsel in Oxford to get that through, but I'm hoping to do that. Um, and then future directions. So um, obviously users give us feedback all the time and we would like to, uh, we'd like to build those things in. So they say things like move that button or you know, move that link or why can't I have higher resolution for the images or why doesn't it work on Internet Explorer 9 and Windows 7? We, <laughs> we fixed that one, which is good. <laughs> um, so we need to do that. And there's a whole roadmap and, uh, and uh, way of prioritising those, uh, those feature requests. And then the terms of use I talked about. We have a lot more collections that we want to add and migrate. So all the things that I showed you on Luna, uh, the things from our Polonsky Foundation digitization project with the Vatican Library and, and many others. And then I think most importantly, we want to drink the wine. We want to ensure that the site is really used. So that means engaging much more with our curators and our academics in Oxford and, and getting them to talk about the collections and to use them. Uh, and also our public visitors. And we have many of those in Oxford now, particularly with the opening of the, the Western Library right in the centre of, uh, of the city. And I'd also love us to have uh, a commercial service for the colleges um, in Oxford, which have a sort of separate, uh, financially independent status. So I'd love this to be a sustainable service that actually generates some revenue in its own right so that we can, we can develop it further. And as it happens tomorrow, I'm talking at Hartford College in Oxford, where I'm a fellow, um, about the Ortelius Atlas. And that was the first college collection that we digitised on the site. Um, and it's a really interesting story because uh, Hartford College is returning the Ortelius Atlas to the Humboldt Library in Berlin, uh, where it turns out it was taken during the Second World War. Um, and so, you know, they've, they, as soon as they discover that, they've done the right thing, they're giving the atlas back, but we have digitised it and it's available on this site now for everybody to see. So that's absolutely wonderful. And I'd also love there to be digital.oxford. So what was, what was very gratifying, I think, for the people who worked on this project was the fact that we were um, the only bit of um, the glam sector in Oxford that was mentioned in the Vice-Chancellor's speech. 
uh, last week. So it would be wonderful if we could roll this out uh, for the museums and um, the gardens in Oxford. So we've got, you know, the Oxford Museum of Natural History and the Pitt Rivers and, uh, and many other, the, the history of science and so on. So that would be really exciting. Just a sort of musing, I think, on collaboration, which is in keeping with this year's conference theme and the, uh, the emphasis that DCDC places on encouraging collaboration between organisations, sectors and, and people. Um, and I just wanted to say that this has been a fantastic multidisciplinary collaboration. I can't take any credit for it at all uh, because most of it was done before I joined the Bodleian. Um, but there were a lot of fantastic people working on it. So those are the people who worked on the project. They all did an amazing job. And, you know, it brought together uh, a design agency, our infrastructure people, our developers, UI specialists, uh, back-end developers, imaging specialists, uh, digitization specialists. So this was a, a you know, a multidisciplinary collaboration where everybody had a different expertise and they worked as a team and created something I think that, that's really beautiful and I hope you agree so thank you very much for listening